Hey everybody, I just wanted to make a little video um, showing the mining machine design that I came up with alongside the world's most pitiful volcano. This is just a random map I generated to do this build in and uh, just happened to see that there by the spawn. Anyway, um, so I will try to fly slowly around this a couple times for those of you that just want to pause the video to see how this is done and build it together without listening to me sitting here and talking. Um, the machine is based off of the frame blocks and the frame sliders from the funky locomotion mod. I didn't even know this mod existed, I just happened to run across it from searching frame in NEI and I played around with it a little bit and found that it's very similar to the Red Power 2 frames and frame motors. Um, not quite the same, there are a couple limitations with it. Um, as you can see, it's definitely not quite as compact as you could make with the Red Power 2 frames, but it still works really well. And uh, down here is the little power and storage system uh, that I got going on. And I'll show you more about how this works later. I get, uh, I've had a lot of people ask me um, about how the storage works on something like this, and it's a, it's a design that I've used for a while, but I've never really seen anybody else put together before, but I, I, I really like it. It's a lot better than the Ender Chess. Anyway, so I'm going to go ahead and start building this. Um, let me clean up my inventory here a bit. So we'll just start off with the mining wheels. Let me get an angel block. Um, I have very little experience with Applied Energistics 2, so I'm just going to build this uh, eight miners wide like this one because I believe with the channels and everything and that, it's, it's definitely not quite as easy as just putting down one controller and going from there so just for simplicity's sake we'll go with eight blocks. Uh, one limitation to these frames from Funky Locomotion is that they, you know there's no such thing as a tube frame and they have to be touching absolutely everything um, on the machine so just keep that in mind when you design it. Any um, of your power you know for like your Ender IO conduits um, they all have to be touching one of the faces of these frames in, in some way or another, otherwise they'll just get left behind or the machine will jam up in the front. So we'll start out like that and um, go ahead and put the interfaces on top of the mining wheels. And again, every single one of these is going to need to be touching like that. Um, and then on the front here, we're going to run the conduit for the power. And again, they all need to be touching. Now this, this is the one downside to this machine. Um, I, last time I made one of these machines, I built something very similar in the TPPI pack, and I used the modular force field system to move it. And the cool thing about that was that you could use AE transition panes on the front of the machine. I would set them up facing forward this way in these two spots and I would put it underground in the deep dark because it could pretty much bulldoze through anything as long as you put it below the bedrock pillars. With this design, you can't do that, unfortunately, because of how these frames have to be touching everything. There would always be one empty or one f exposed frame that could get stuck on stuff. So with a machine like this, you're going to be best off building it in an area where it's just high above the ground, where it's not going to run into any trees or anything else up in the air that could that could stop it. I don't actually know if Miscraft is even in this pack. If it is, that would be a great place to set one of these machines up. Um, so now here's here's kind of an example of why you know this becomes an issue. You got to remember you've got to have your power conduit connected in some way. And when you look at this, this one conduit right there is not touching any frames. So you're going to have to do something maybe like that. It's going to be a little ugly, but you know it does work. And of course these here. These frames have to be touching the rest of it as well. So we'll just do that to make that work. Okay, coming back over here, um, I'll come back maybe two blocks just like that. And we will set up these frame sliders. They can go down like that. You can rotate them with a wrench. Um, I haven't figured out exactly how the faces work on this. I believe if you shift that will rotate. Uh, let's see if it'll work from the bottom. There we go. 
Okay, so you want them both facing forward like this. Now one thing, this one here, you're going to want to just right normal right click with, not shift, but just normal right click that face of the frame block. That's going to keep this top slider from sticking to it. And the same goes for any other blocks. If you want something to not stick to the frames, you know, right click it. So, you know, um, these mining pipes that come out of the mining wells have a tendency to sometimes drop and not disappear so on the underside of your machine I would recommend going through and doing that so if by chance some of these pipes get left behind they don't start getting drug along with the machine and you know if you got this set up somewhere where stuff is running alongside it or you've got two machines but want to keep them separate again just right click those blocks so they can't stick now um, on top here we'll run one more row so what's going to happen is when this frame slider receives a rent stowed signal it's going to push this one forward and then when this one receives a signal it's going to push all the frames forward now this one um, down here you can just kind of run alongside there to make sure it's connected because we are going to need to remove this one block right there now um, the cool thing is wireless redstone plays really nice with these frames, um, which it did not with MFFS. These items would always fall off as soon as it moved. But uh, this makes it really easy to set up a way to turn your machine on and off. And we'll just set that to 1112 for the channel. Now, um, all you really need for the redstone signal is just one wire right there, because it'll automatically activate this one. And when this guy moves forward, it'll be able to receive that signal as well. So we should be covered for movement there. Now we'll go ahead and finish running our wires for power. You will need to come down. Um, uh, honestly, you don't need to do this because these do have an internal buffer for storage. But just in case, I would recommend running um, one more conduit right here because that means that when this slider is moved forward, it'll get charged up as well and not only be able to be charged when it's set up in the rear like that. For power, um, I'm going to use a Tesseract. I tried using an energy cell directly with the frames. That was one block that I found that it didn't play nice with. Um, so, you know, you'll have to send your power remotely anyway. And the cool thing is this one Tesseract will also handle the transport of our items. So I think what I'm going to do is put this Tesseract right there. And again, remember, everything is going to need to be touching a frame in one way or another. So... I'm actually going to make one more out here. And all those are touching there. Um, remember this guy right here in the middle wouldn't normally be touching something, so we'll set that up like that there. Now, um, for the ME controller, we can place this right here, and then that way it's already contacting the interface. And you know what, I won't go and actually move this test rack back one. Now here's how the storage is going to work. Um, we've got an ME storage bus that is going to face this tesseract like that. And then, let's see, missing cable, there it is. An ME cable will connect in there. And the reason is, we've actually made a very, very tiny um, applied energistic system here. And the only valid location for these interfaces to send items to is going to be that storage bus. These interfaces are treated just like an inventory as far as the mining wells are concerned. So all the items will go into the interface. And the only place they can go is into the storage bus at the Tesseract. And the cool thing about that is it's instant. There's no, you don't have to have any kind of a crazy um, setup to pull items out in your base with like an ender chest or something like that. Everything is just going to instantly be transferred. As soon as it comes out of the mining well, it's going to end up in your A system. So uh, let's see, I'm going to need one more frame right here for this. I think everything else is looking OK. All right, so I'm going to make another channel here because you can see I've already built one of these machines and I just want to set it up. So we're going to send items, do nothing with liquids, and receive energy on this Tesseract. And as far as I can tell, we should be pretty much good to go here. We'll try it out in a second and see if I forgot anything where we've got stuck. Now, um, I'm going to build just a little platform up in the sky here to control this thing with. 
So let's see, we'll need another Tesseract, um, an interface, get our ME drive, let's see, I'm going to put that over here, I think, the ME, we need another ME controller, and let's see, I'm looking down at my system over there at how I set that up. Oh, I know what I'm forgetting. Uh, I'll put the ME controller up there and, you know, just pretend this is going to be your conduit from your power system right there. So that's powered up. And then last but not least, we'll connect this here and set up the terminal. And we'll get a storage cell or a drive to put inside there. And then on this one, we're going to be receiving items, nothing with fluid, and sending energy. So hopefully that makes sense. The items are going to come from that Tesseract into this one. Then they will be placed in the interface, which the valid inventory here is going to be the storage cell. So everything should end up there. And as you can see, when I powered this up, it actually dug down, and all the items are right there. I'm going to expand this a little more to set up a timer here to control this thing with. The cool thing about this design is you can easily scale it to your um, power system. You know, if you don't have a ton of power and the thing is running kind of slow, you can just slow everything down to make sure that your power production is able to keep up with it. All right, timer, I think that should be everything we need. Um, so we'll just start out with a lever over here. Put down the timer. Set this up to maybe five seconds, turn that off. Now I'm trying to remember how exactly I had this set up. Um, going to place the toggle latch right here. And the, the reason behind this is that these uh, frame sliders don't play well with a very short redstone signal, um, so using something like a pulse former generally does not make a long enough signal for them to be happy. Uh, usually they won't move or it'll have to cycle a couple times in order for them to move. And uh, so we're just building a very small circuit here to um, kind of slow things down and make a bit longer of a pulse. So what we're going to do here is uh, have a repeater, and maybe we'll set that up to 32 ticks. Let me clean this up just a little bit here. I'm going to place the repeater over on this side. And what this is going to do is it's, it's going to make a slight delay on this toggle latch and then cut it off. So this um, output here will normally be our um, output to the uh, frame quarry. And you know what, I think I'm going to turn this latch around the other direction. So you can see how we're, you know, kind of pulsing this. Which it's going every five seconds, but it's generating a little bit longer of a pulse. And with that, we'll put down our transmitter. Oops, wrong one. And set that to 112, just like that. So we should be pretty much ready to go. Um, I'm just going to place down a switch. Whoops. A switch right here to... Uh, Gonna test this real quick, and you can see there went our frame motor forward there, or our uh, frame slider there. And then on the next one, we'll go ahead and turn this on. So every five seconds, it should be moving forwards. And I think we're stuck on something. I see this is where you have to get a little creative with trying to figure out what is holding up your 
device and I can pretty much guarantee you it's this piece right here well no that should be touching the other sides that shouldn't be it hmm be back in just a second once I find it alright sorry about that I believe I found it um, see this one conduit right here is not touching any frames I'm willing to bet that's what's holding us up. So I'm going to break that conduit and let's see. I'll hook up our power up top like this instead and put a frame down here so that that one is touching. All right, let's turn this back on again and see if that gets us going. So the first motor moves forwards and there it goes. That was it. So it looks like five seconds might be a little bit fast for our mining wheels, so that's pretty easy to fix. Let's turn it up to maybe eight. There we go. Looks like those are definitely going all the way down to bedrock. I could probably take a second off of it here. Perfect. See again, um, don't worry if it's a little slower, just um, add more time on the timer so that it has plenty of time to dig down. And you can see over here just how quickly everything enters the system as this thing moves. You know, there's there's no lag, no dropped items, nothing sitting in tubes or getting stuck in inner chest. Just as soon as it pops out of the top of that mining well, it ends up in your A system. And again, just one more kind of overview of this timer. You've got a lever, the timer, this one's set to seven seconds, which seems to play well with the mining whales at this height. Um, pulse former, just make sure that there's a long enough pulse because the timer can output a pretty short pulse sometimes. Um, we've got the toggle latch with the switch on the latch facing this direction. And then coming off of here as well, we have a repeater uh, set to 32 ticks and it's set to the other input on the toggle latch. There are two inputs and basically it um, keeps toggling this one back and forth after it receives its first signal just kind of making a longer delay. Now if you're playing on a server with a lot of lag or something like that and you find that you need to slow it down even more you can maybe set that up to 128 ticks and that's going to really increase the time of this. However you can see if you have a constant signal for too long um, these will actually keep moving. Um, if these receive, a, they don't need to receive a pulse. They can receive a um, constant signal, and they'll keep moving. But if you do that, it's too fast. So you know, I think 32 tick seems to work just fine. If you really need a to pulse these slowly, the best idea would probably be to set up two separate um, receivers on there, so that each frame slider has its own. Just make sure when you go to turn this thing off, you make uh, set it off like that. If, if this kind of ends in the wrong location, it will keep a constant signal of that and that thing will just run off forever and make uh, quite a bit of a mess. So you can see we're still set. Um, should run a little bit fast there. So I'm going to put this back on 32. And we should be good to go. So see how it missed quite a bit because it was just moving way too fast for the mining wheels to be able to keep up. We've actually mined through the other machine there. Whoops. 
so hope you guys uh, liked watching the video and maybe got some ideas on how to set one of these up in your own world. There's uh, plenty of ways to do it, and this is just the way that I do. And I uh, look forward to seeing what else people can come up with and add to it. Thanks for watching.